So you've done quite a bit of treatment in your room and you've got good control, reflections even kind of low mid-range down to the base region, but below 100 hertz, ah, the room's still pretty wild and uncontrolled. And so as you are going on the internet searching for solutions, you come across membrane traps. Mm. And so maybe you can get these finely tuned absorbers that really pinpoint the exact problem frequencies that still remain below 100 hertz and like a sniper rifle just shoot them down. Well, if it was only as easy as that, but that's what we're going to get into in this video. Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. And this is week four in the Bass Trap Breakdown series, where I explain every single type of bass trap out there, cut through the nonsense, and allow you to make smart and hopefully evidence-based decisions about the acoustic treatment in your home studio. This week, we're venturing into the realm of sealed box bass traps, aka tune traps, aka resonance traps, and in particular, in this case, membrane traps. Of course, this series is accompanied by my complete guide to bass traps and bass trapping, which you can download completely for free at the link in the description. And everything I'll be covering from foam wedges to tuned resonator traps is neatly organized in there for you to reference at any time. So of course that includes how you actually identify them and potential causes of confusion, how and when to use a particular bass trap, how many you need and the pros and cons of each. So let's get into it. Membrane traps are a subcategory of the sealed base trap design. It's basically a sealed wooden box that has a membrane on one side. That membrane is usually made out of wood, so it's a rigid membrane, or it comes as a limp membrane, so some sort of heavy mass-loaded vinyl usually. And unfortunately, that makes them fairly difficult to distinguish from your typical wrapped porous absorber panels. So if you look here, for example, this is the Scopus tuned membrane base trap by GIK Acoustics, and it literally looks like a wooden box wrapped in fabric. Here's another example. This is the tuned membrane base trap by Music City Acoustics. And again, it's basically just a box wrapped in fabric. And that's really the main cause of potential confusion with these types of base traps, in that looking at them from the outside, you can't really tell what it is you're looking at. To make it even more confusing, sometimes they're also called diaphragmatic traps or panel traps, and they all just fall under the same category, at least in my opinion, I don't really see any difference between them, which is that, again, these are sealed box tuned resonance traps with a rigid or a limp membrane that seals the box on one side. Now you might also come across it in the shape of a half cylinder or a polycylindrical shape. And the potential cause of confusion here is to distinguish them from pure poly diffusers. What you need to look out for is the fact that this is a sealed cavity base trap. So a sealed box with a, an enclosed air space inside this box in order for the membrane to resonate on top of this air cushion. The box really needs to be airtight for this to work, which brings me to my next point. So this is basically a mass spring system. The mass is the membrane and the spring is the air inside the cavity. And that mass can actually go into resonance on the air cushion inside. That's what basically turns it into a tuned resonance device. So you can kind of think of it like a kick drum, except that you're not hitting the membrane with the beater, but it's just sound hitting the membrane, which then starts to vibrate sympathetically with the sound hitting it. That is transferred into the cavity and then through various mechanisms of mechanical losses, both through how the membrane is mounted on this actual sealed cavity and also usually some type of porous absorption inside the cavity, 
you create these losses which then rob the sound wave of its energy. Now here's what distinguishes it from our porous material base traps that we've been looking at in this series so far. And that is that these devices need proper sound pressure in order to excite the system and put it into resonance. And that means two things. First of all, these devices need to be placed in a location of high sound pressure, but not just generally high sound pressure, but at the actual frequency that this device is tuned to. And only then will the system actually go into resonance and this device actually work as an acoustic absorber. The last thing to understand about how these things work is that because it's a resonant system, it comes with a Q, so how narrow the bandwidth is at which it absorbs. And that also directly relates to the damping of the system. Depending on how it is tuned and how it is damped, you either get a very narrow and high absorption peak that is very efficient, but very narrow in frequency, or you get broader absorption with a, a, a wider Q, but more highly damped, and so it's not as good at absorbing sound. So to give you some example of what that might look like, here is a model of these absorption coefficients that I just rigged together in porous absorber calculator, right? So we have one version here, which is typically the rigid membrane, so the wood membrane, which has a a high Q, a high absorption peak. It is very effective at that particular frequency, but not particularly broadband. And if you damp the system more, the Q comes down, it becomes wider. You're gaining more width in terms of frequency bandwidth, but you're also losing some effectiveness in terms of absorption. And that is more typical of a kind of limp membrane st style trap. So when using some type of mass loaded vinyl, for example. Now, because these are pressure absorbers, like I mentioned before, and they are tuned to a particular frequency, they are very reliant on proper placement in the room. You can't just get one or two of these units and just place them somewhere where you have space under the table <laughs> next to the door and expect them to actually work. This is a very methodical process that you need to follow in order to set these up correctly. So that involves really understanding at which frequencies your room still resonates. So where you have room modes, at which frequencies, and where these room modes exhibit high sound pressure in the room. That's where you then want to place these tuned absorbers in order for them to actually work. And that, of course, is also one of the major problems with these devices for a typical home studio. If you don't have a lot of space, your room is already stuffed full of stuff, and you don't really have very much space left, where are you going to put these? Or rather, maybe you'll identify the proper place where, to, where you want to put these, but it turns out that's where you have a door or a window, or that's where a closet is, or just some other type of furniture, maybe a couch. And that's usually the main problem with these types of tuned absorbers, is that you can't really put them where they ideally need to go in order to work, at least in your typical home studio scenario. The other reality of using these is that you'd actually need way more of these units to get a significant effect than you would expect. Usually the kind of idea that you get when you first read about these is, oh my God, great, I can just get two of these and kind of place them in the corners and be done with low end control in my room. Unfortunately, that's just not the reality of things. You basically need to get four, six, eight of these units often tuned to different frequencies in the low range to tackle those particular room modes and then very meticulously place them in order to actually get the effect. And so in practice, oftentimes it's using up just as much space as you would with porous absorption, except that you're not nearly as flexible in terms of how you can actually use them. On top of that, they're usually also a lot deeper than you'd think. GIK did a great job here with this particular unit tuned to 40 hertz, where they say it's 25 centimeters deep, that's just short of a foot, but 
usually when you're, for example, trying to build these yourself, you're looking at larger depths than that. It's very possible for these to become two feet deep or more if you want to actually reach very low frequencies, maybe down to 20 hertz. Yeah, so just trying to make the point in a home studio where space is a premium, you can't think that using membrane traps is going to solve the problem of you not having enough space. These things use usually in practice just as much space as your typical porous absorbers. And like I said, they're not nearly as flexible in terms of where you actually place them. In an ideal world, if your room is big enough, if you have enough space, you would basically combine this type of resonance traps with porous absorbers where these cover everything below, let's say, 80 to 100 hertz, and then the porous absorption covers everything above that. Of course, in practice, rooms aren't usually big enough to do that. Budget is also a major concern. So in a home studio, I'd really rather you think about these as a last potential step. Once you've exhausted all possibilities of base absorption using porous base traps. And maybe, just maybe, you have enough space for these to actually do the job, maybe covering the range from 20 hertz to 60 hertz, for example. But again, in most home studios, that's usually not the case. And one of the main reasons why I say make the most out of porous absorption, it is the ideal tool for home studio acoustic treatment, and it doesn't really get much better than that. Using membrane traps is really something that you want to leave to professionals who have a lot of experience designing and building these and actually getting them to work reliably. Because we haven't even talked about DIYing these things, and I'll get to that in a second. In terms of pros and cons, the obvious pros are if you could actually get them to work, if you have enough space, then these are very effective at controlling frequencies all the way down to 20 hertz potentially below that even. In fact, this is really the ideal device to do that, again, if you know what you're doing. But the cons, unfortunately, in a home studio at least, far outweigh the pros. And the first one, again, being that you need to place them so accurately in your room, you probably need more space than you actually think you'd need. You probably need more of these units than you'd think you'd need. They're way more expensive than porous absorption. And talking about DIYing these, if you actually want to build these yourself, there are so many potential pitfalls to get it wrong. First off, the models that we use to calculate the resonant frequencies of tuned membrane traps are very inaccurate because they unfortunately don't take into account a lot of the very practical considerations that goes into designing these as well. So there are things like the actual mounting of the membrane, the stiffness of the membrane, the dimensions of the membrane, the box, again, the materials of the box. It might be too thin. Maybe you're not using thick enough MDF, for example, and it actually starts resonating itself potentially it's not airtight. You need to seal these things airtight in order for them to work. You need to somehow damp the cavity. And so the question becomes, where inside the cavity do you actually place porous absorption? How much? Do you place it close to the membrane? Do you place it at the back of the unit, somewhere in the middle? What gas flow resistance do you use? So what density for porous absorption inside the cavity do you use? And there are a bunch of other considerations. And all of these affect those two main variables that determine the absorption characteristics, right? So the frequency that it's tuned to and the damping of the device. And if you don't get that right, your frequency might be way off and the damping might be way off. And ergo, this thing basically doesn't work. And at that point, you've probably wasted a lot of money and a lot of time into something that literally looks like a box and isn't anything else but a box. Yeah, so if you're thinking about DIYing these and you haven't done this yet, I would very much recommend you always see this as an experiment that you do outside of the actual 
treatment plan for your studio. So don't incorporate some type of membrane trap design into your full treatment plan. Instead, think of it as an experiment that you do on its own in order to actually get a grip on all these variables that go into designing and building this thing before you plan it into the actual acoustics of your space. For everybody else, if you want to try them, I would recommend you buy them off the shelf from a reputable company like GIK Acoustics or Music City Acoustics from Nashville, because that way you can make sure that they're actually designed and built the right way and they actually work as intended. Yeah, it still comes down to the whole placement problem at that point, but at least you're working with a functioning unit. So here's what I want you to take away when thinking about membrane traps. Don't think that this is a sniper rifle solution that just works out of the box. These are not smaller or easier to use. You need a significant number of these units to actually work. They are extremely sensitive to placement and DIYing comes with an extremely high failure probability. These are devices that are really reserved for experienced designers who know what they're doing, who've done this a lot of times, and typically who focus on very high-end builds. But when it comes to home studios, unfortunately, these shouldn't be your first choice when it comes to low-end control. These aren't magic bullets, and my advice really is to stick to what works, aka porous absorption-based traps, especially if you're starting out. Well, <laughs> to be frank, even if you're not starting out, if you're treating a home studio, stick to porous absorption. It works, it's reliable, it's easy to use, it's cheap. And of course, if you want help with this and if you're actually ready to reliably fix the low end in your studio once and for all, check out my Build a Better Bass Trap course. I'll also link that in the description. In it, I walk you through designing and building your very own porous absorber bass traps that actually work so you can get that tight, clear low end without killing the vibe in your room. It's practical, it's tested, it's gonna save you months of second guessing. All right, next week we're looking at Helmholtz Resonators, another tuned precision trap. But with that, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.